Thank you for watching. This YouTube and podcast series is by the Verveke Foundation, which in addition to supporting my work, also offers courses, practices, workshops, and other projects dedicated to responding to the meaning crisis. If you would like to support this work, please consider joining our Patreon. You can find the link in the show notes. Welcome, everyone, to the Cognitive Science Show. This is episode 13 of Transcendent Naturalism. I'm here with my ongoing partner in all of these Cognitive Science Shows, Greg Enriquez. And I'm here with somebody that some of you should recognize from some of the videos. We released a video with Matt and I not that long ago on my channel. And this is Matt Segal. Um, it's uh, a really great pleasure to have Matt here. I'm reading and his excellent book right now, uh, Crossing the Threshold. Uh, let's see if that will come into view. There we go. Crossing the Threshold. Great subtitle, Eth Etheric Imagination in the Post-Kantian Process Philosophy of Schelling and Whitehead. Uh, excellent book. And Matt, uh, my son, and I are actually reading it together, uh, which oh. is a, a great pleasure. And I'm enjoying the book thoroughly. So um, uh, welcome, Matt. I'll turn things over now to Greg. Yeah, I'm really excited to have you here, Matt. Uh, really looking forward to diving in today. Uh, and we'll, of course, continue this conversation next week, uh, as we've done. Um, you know, for me, I've danced around Whitehead a lot. Uh, I've danced around the philosophy of the organism. Um, I'm really looking forward to seeing how uh, we weave uh, this in relationship to transcendent naturalism. Uh, I thought that it was really uh, coincidental. I put up a post on you talk being endo naturalism, uh, and you shared a link uh, that had enormous number of parallels with that. Uh, so welcome. Uh, we're coming off a really cool conversation with Jordan Hall, uh, where we're talking sort of about the fifth joint point, uh, thinking about tech, uh, the vision of the future, and the kind of wisdom philosophies we need for this. Uh, I think Whitehead and the process philosophy that you're advocating is uh, very congruent with the kinds of reflections we need, and it's lovely to have you here. Yeah, great to be in dialogue uh, with both of you, and I've been looking forward to this for uh, a long time. So, yeah, glad glad we're together. So, where do we dive in? Well, I know maybe the uh, um, you know uh, your reflections on you know maybe the core argument that maybe in the first four episodes around transcendent naturalism um mm -hmm. things like that and i don't know where you've dipped in and out of some of the other responses that have been made um but you know what is your response to the argument uh what uh, what convergences do you have what divergences do you have from it you know and then we just i'm sure things will take catch fire very quickly and we'll just take it from there how's that sound yeah, sounds great. So yeah, I've watched, I think most of, uh, I may have missed a few episodes here and there, but I've watched uh, most of the, was this the second season of the Cognitive Science <laughs> show? And <laughs> yeah. um, I think I consider myself uh, part of this, uh, if, if you'll accept me, part of the same effort uh, to yeah. articulate yeah. Um, a, uh, a new kind of natural philosophy, let's call it. Mm. And um, I think uh, bringing in things like information theory, uh, bringing in the, the complexity sciences, bringing in uh, emergence, obviously, but also some conception of emanation and yep. Yep. Uh, sort of revitalizing some neoplatonic insights in a contemporary scientific context, uh, I think is um, quite exciting and uh, an important project that I, I see myself as, uh, yeah, as I said, uh, engaged in and a partner with both of you in. Um, I I will say though that I think I've never felt fully comfortable identifying my approach as as um, naturalistic. Mm -hmm. And that's not because I want to make reference to something something supernatural. Um, but typically naturalism, I mean, we could define it as a methodology, we could define it as a metaphysics, and, you know, maybe we can get into the difference there, but either way, it, it as either the method or the metaphysics, the ontology, um, either both of the, the, the ways in which they have been defined um, in the context of modern Western science, I think has prevented us from affirming something like formal causality or final causality prevented us from taking more than just um, some narrow construal of the five senses 
um, as granting us access to to a, a real world. I think so. There's a limited form of empiricism that's been built into um, the method of of doing natural science, uh, and and a sense in which naturalism would entail a kind of um, global mechanistic explanation. Um, and so on those construals of what naturalism means, I have felt a bit suffocated and, and unable to fully um, adopt the label. Now, I think transcendent naturalism is trying to bring in some of these things that mm -hmm. uh, traditionally naturalism has um, forbid or, or relegated to the supernatural um, or said that, oh, well, that's really just part of human consciousness. And that's kind of this anomalous peripheral thing. We don't quite know how it emerged but we don't need to talk about um, subjectivity we don't need to talk about teleology until this weird consciousness thing emerges everything else we can explain naturalistically and i think you know whether it's you talk or uh this sort of neoplatonic retrieval um i think that kind of naturalism i i have more time for and so then it just becomes a question of the rhetoric i guess or the um the way that we start to bridge with the broader cultural conversation about the yeah. meaning of life and the place of the human being in the universe. Um, there's a certain kind of fundamentalist religion um, and a certain kind of new age narcissism that we, I think I would also want to resist, mm -hmm. um, which is why sometimes referring to naturalism and really trying to maintain um, scientific rigor that, that can be really important, not just as a rhetorical move, but as a methodological move. Um, but I also think that, um, and I don't necessarily think either of you disagree with this, but I think there is something of tremendous value that needs to be inherited from the world religions um, that we can't just rebuild from scratch or something in a more rational or scientific way. Like that, that just isn't gonna happen. Um, we, so we have to, inherit something and this new age thing you know i've heard you speak about this in different contexts more recently uh john as a kind of reaction against uh a more reductionistic reading of of science um that that also leaves behind the rigor of science yeah. and and the empirical methodology of science and the importance of um justifying one's knowledge and all these things it leaves behind what it what we really can't leave behind, but it's this new age, these new age movements are reaching for something that I think is valid and important. Um, and so there's a needle to be thread somewhere here, but I think that's my general response to the project uh, that I take you to be you two to be engaged in. That, that was um, very very fantastic. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Greg. I just wanted to say I think that I think that was a very fair reflection, and not only fair, insightful. Right. I, I think that this one of the things that this project. Greg, you're kind of quiet. Um, Can you get a little closer okay. to your computer? Sure. Um, how's this for sound? Is that all right? A bit better. I it... wonder. Yeah, I wonder if your mic is selected. If you're trying to use your um, headphone mic or the computer mic, it might be. Could be. Let me see here. Selected uh, incorrectly. Just a guess. Okay. Let's try. Uh, how does that work? Is that mm. better? No, not worse. It's worse. Yeah, it's worse. We can hear some <laughs> fan or AC in the background or something. It's fine. It will, I could just. Oh, now we don't hear anything. Not hearing you at all. Now, now we don't hear anything, Greg. Sorry, we opened up a whole can of worms by trying to change. <laughs> yeah, the yeah, yeah. We 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 prodded the imp of the perverse there. <laughs> Well, while uh, Greg is solving that out, maybe I'll I'll yeah, say yeah, something. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, so so uh, Matt, I think that was very uh, uh, charitable. I I'd, I'd like to perhaps uh, um, start on one of the places that I think does need more discussion. Um, um, and this is particular, like you said, what is the relationship? of inheritance from the legacy religions because I, I agree with you this is not rejection this is not repudiation this is not refutation that's not what transcendent naturalism is doing and um i i, I think i know greg agrees with me about this um and so um yeah i'd like to I, I mean part of what 
wasn't brought sort of foregrounded in the core argument I made that actually started originally in Greg's Consilience Conference, which was amazing, um, was a lot of the work I've been doing in two other areas, well, three other areas, actually, that I think might be germane. One, of course, is something you, I think you're familiar with, what I've been talking about, different kinds of knowing, um, and that um, uh, there is a proper role also for uh, Corban's Corban sense of the imaginal, especially when we're talking about um, um, non-propositional kinds of knowing. And then um, the notion of ritual as imaginal augmentation that allows us to pick up on things that we otherwise would be insensitive to and to come into proper relation. And that what we're doing with the non-propositional kinds of knowing can be, I think, fairly justifiably um, argued to be, you know, processes of overcoming attentional and affective self-deception and identity formation and the enhancement of connectedness that fall under the name wisdom and overlap with meaning in life. Um, and that if we have this language of wisdom and meaning cultivation and the imaginal and ritual, um, and they can be, uh, properly explained, not explained away, but explained within sort of a four E cog sci framework. I wonder if, if that, and I think that is all very consistent with the argument of transcendent naturalism. Um, I suppose what I'm saying is I'm proposing to you that that's my answer of what we can get um, from the legacy religions. And the reason why I sort of stop there is because I, I bump up into the pluralism argument. Um, about the you know the the vast differences. Um, this is why I'm against a sort of easy Huxleyan kind of perennialism. Um, even though Huxley doesn't really have that, if you read uh, the perennial philosophy, he has a much more cautious thing going on. But nevertheless, uh, you know, I uh, I find that I find the pluralism argu argument very powerful, very persuasive, um, and that you have to drop below the level of uh, propositions to get uh, convergence and also to get enough universal phenomena that you can get a scientific purchase on them. And so I would argue, uh, I'm, I'm going to make a little bit stronger argument because uh, I, I know you, you're definitely up to it. So that's not, that's not a concern on my part, um, which is I'm making the, a stronger argument that I think that's all we can get from them um, because of the pluralism and because of you know, you, if you're going to get some sort of comprehensive ontological grasp on there, there has to be important invariants across time and culture, etc. Um, and so that's what I would say. And I, and I would say one of the advantages of transcendent naturalism, especially with the notion of strong transcendence, is it gives real teeth and depth to the cultivation of wisdom, uh, the cultivation of character, the realization of meaning, etc. Now, I'm, I'm, I, um, and one more point, and I don't want to put Greg at a disadvantage, but I mean, and I'm only, I'm only about, I think, 50 pages into your beautiful book. Uh, by the way, it's really good, Matt. It's really good. Oh, thank uh, you, John. Like, I, like, no, seriously, it's, it's like, it's really good. Um, I'm going through a big whitehead phase again, which I do. I dip in and dip out, <laughs> and I'm going through a really big one. Um, but you are, you, uh, I guess I'm also inviting you to say if this notion of the imaginal, especially the way I've tried to enrich it beyond the way Corban has discussed it, is it getting, is it convergent or is it close or is it adjacent to what you mean by etheric imagination and the important role you place it for crossing over the subjective objective divide over the Kantian uh, guardianship, as you beautifully put it. Um, and so, um, that's my initial response, but uh, I I did interrupt to give Greg time to get his, right. His oh, demons well, back. how does it, how does this sound now? Does this uh, is the mic great. okay now? Yeah, 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 um, much better. Uh, I'll let that. Uh, I'll, I have definitely lots to pick up on. I, let's let's let the flow go, uh, and uh, well, let's have Matt respond to that, and then we can come back to some of my comments about naturalism uh, and where uh, I see this, which of course will be very congruent. Yeah. Um, thanks, Greg. So I'll, I'll briefly respond um, to say that I think what I mean by etheric imagination is quite similar to what Corban is doing with the imaginal. I can't remember if I briefly cite him or not. Maybe I, maybe I didn't in the in the book, but I'm aware of his work, 
And I think the key, of course, is to make a distinction between fantasy um, or the imaginary and the imaginal, because there's there's a ontological um, heft to this this. Mm, I don't want to call it a mere. It's not a mere concept. It's not just a percept either. It's that in between space yeah. um, that I think has real um, ontological significance and can. And I think what what I would say my book is trying to argue for is that it has. There's an epistemological um, method that needs to be developed that would allow us to be scientific about uh, imaginal perception, mm -hmm. uh, imaginal experience, let's say, um, because again, it's not quite perception, it's not quite conceptual, it's like, where, where's the imagination in that? It's before that distinction. Mm -hmm. Kant's pointing this out in his own way. Um, and so, yeah, I think there's a lot of consistency there. There's probably some differences because I'm not coming straight out of Corban. I'm coming more out of Steiner, who's a vexing figure um, of great value for me in my own work, but also there's a lot I have no idea what to do with in Steiner's work. Um, so that's on the, on the imagination question you raised, but in terms of um, ritual as what we can recover from the world religions, absolutely. Uh, and, and the non-propositional forms of knowing that ritual allows us to cultivate where I think at their best, these ancient rituals, which in many cases, like what we call, uh, or what, what the Catholic Church or um, Christianity has called uh, the Eucharist, um, Mass, etc., has much earlier roots that, mm -hmm. that the ritual, um, the ur form of that ritual goes very, very deep, right? And so if you put the world religions in that kind of evolutionary context, cultural evolution uh, in that context, there's a more overlap, but also plurality is essential. I, I would even, maybe this is an even stronger argument for pluralism. Um, I think at this point to do, to touch religion at all, to be religious at all, has to be in the context of interreligious dialogue. Oh, good. Um, good. And not just between people who are committed to one faith. I would even say, um, as individuals, I think, given our access to this, uh, to, to the world religions, no <clears throat> one's just born now in, in, in one little tribe or in one, one little society or, uh, and, and can just assume that theirs is the only religion. And how could anyone disagree? This is like the only game in town. Like, no, we're, none of us are in that situation mm -hmm. anymore. And so I think there's, there's a kind of responsibility that each of us has to ourselves become inter- in, intra religious like internal to ourselves, we can hold multiple religious commitments, right? And so the, the the challenge of religious pluralism is something each person I think needs to work out psychologically, psycho spiritually, mm -hmm. um, and not everyone is is at that place where they can engage in that way. But um, for those who do have a more who are raised in a in a context or or later in life find that they're called to a, a particular religious tradition, I think. To do that authentically and uh, to do it responsibly, you need to be in, in continual dialogue with those who have other faith commitments uh, and not just respect their right to have those faith commitments and to be different from you, but to be interested in that difference because it's gonna reflect back on your own self-understanding, right? So only in this kind of a context, I think, can religion remain relevant without being uh, dangerous and actually mm -hmm. holding us back um, but we need it. If we can engage it in this way, I think because of the way that ritual is a form of knowing that I think allows us to entrain with cosmic rhythms, we're not going to overcome this alienation by thinking more about it. Uh, there's an actual performance that I think the world religions uh, have, have allowed us to cultivate generation to generation. And that that performance, those ritual performances that nobody quite understands. Like, why are we really doing this? It, it doesn't matter if you don't understand why you're doing it, because like, it's, it's the same reason that the sun is rising. Right. And there's a confusion that can happen there when you understand the symbolism at work in ritual. And you think that like, Oh, well, if we don't do the ritual, the sun won't rise. Mm. Well, no, but you're, you're, when you're doing ritual, you're participating in that's in that you're entrained to that cosmic rhythm. And so that sense that, if I stop doing the ritual, the sun actually won't rise. It, it makes a little bit more sense. Like it's a it's a faulty uh, idea to, to a 
assume that, but you're so entrained with that broader cosmic rhythm that you start to think that you are it. Mm. Right? And there's, if we can, if we can adopt that mode of, of cognition, that way of knowing without making that mistake where you literalize it, um, then I think we can inherit the great value of, yeah, these ritual practices. Um, that's beautiful. Um, there's actually, uh, I've been, I had to get my thing fixed, but it's also the case that I've been percolating along uh, uh, with the rhythm of your conversation um, and it, it's touching me. Um, I, there's a lot I want to say about naturalism, but I'll just be brief uh, in relation. Uh, so for me, actually, if you look at the definition, it's a vague definition. Um, I like that in philosophy. Um, it basically is the sort of one world commitment at its essence. Um, but what I want to argue very clearly is that it's not committed to a reductive mechanistic worldview. Like naturalism doesn't commit that. Although many people think that it does, uh, to me that's materialism and actually that's an outdated term even than physicalism. Um, I want to replace both materialism and physicalism with naturalism. Um, and this comes to me from my work in Utah and the concept of behavior um, and the idea really that what natural science commits to epistemologically, ontologically, metaphysically is behavior, which of course is going to uh, enter into a process philosophy view much more readily. Uh, but many people confuse, and indeed John Watson is uh, guilty of this, uh, starting behaviorism, at least within psychology, and yoking it to a reductive sensory reflex mechanism. Uh, but that's not necessary. In fact, B.F. Skinner splits that off, um, if you know the history of behaviorism, and he's a molar behaviorist, not a molecular behaviorist. Um, and he then talks about the behavior of persons, uh, and I would say what we're doing right here is behavior of persons. Um, and you can't go from the molar to the molecular uh, in any kind of stepwise fashion because of recursive looping. Um, and, and ultimately, you talk with the tree of knowledge is trying to say, hey, we need a universal natural behaviorism. When we do that in a new big history view, we can place mindedness in the world. When you place mindedness in the world as a sensory motor loop coming off of organisms, uh, and then us as cultured persons off of that, you get a totally different metaphysical vibe, you know, um, and, and that metaphysical vibe is much more consistent with modern science. And it lets go of the reductive mechanical aspects of naturalism uh, and gives us a universal across the ontological layers and actually corresponding with our scientific epistemology is my argument. Um, so, so for me, I talk about you talk as an endo natural view. What I mean by that is I want to look inside of naturalism and fix it. <laughs> it's broken. You know, uh, the enlightenment didn't place us in right relationship to matter and mind. It gave us the enlightenment gap. Um, we don't have a coherent philosophy that places subject, object, matter and mind in right relation. We can, uh, we can now. Um, and, and, and with focus on naturalism, you know, I, I want to respect uh, the, P, the edges of that where parapsychology, aliens, all the stuff that would be sort of like, it's fascinating, I'm agnostic, but I want to get naturalism focus in on correct and out of exactly the kind of uh, limiting metaphysics uh, and this idea that there's a mind totally separate that can then write formulas and then but don't has to be does not need to be reincorporated uh, into the ontological picture so that I'll say about naturalism then very briefly let me just add and then I'll hush up because uh, I could have too much fun with this uh, this uh, John's imaginal ended up being a huge um, bridging concept for me uh, and in you talk, it turns out that the imaginal does fill in a gap that I had between the perceptual conceptual and the imaginary. And, and, and it yokes that stuff together in a way that um, what you just talked about makes me want to, I will click on and order your book. <laughs> I don't, I haven't st started that. I'm super excited uh, about that. And the last thing I'll say about religions is, you know, I created this iconic um, imagery for you talk, this garden. Uh, and the ultimate icon of the garden is this elephant sun god. Okay? Uh, the, the sun god is from Ra in the Bronze Age. Uh, the elephant is from Ganesha uh, into the Axial Age. It rises over the garden. And inside of it is an elephant that comes together, blind men and the elephant, which is also a connection to modern science and looking, and then ultimately a metamodern view of a holism, a coherent, integrated holism. So when you're speaking about the intra 
interpersonal religious pluralism um, that, that beautifully resonates with my sentiment for how we would rediscover uh, the place of religion uh, going forward. So all of those things were remarkably resonant and I just uh, appreciated so much of what you were um, and then given the opportunity to rip off of it. Mm. Yeah, lovely thoughts there. Um, let me, I'll respond briefly to that. Uh, so I think the one world emphasis um, I'm, I'm down with, I think, uh, but I wouldn't want that to mean mm, what, uh, there's a physicist and philosopher whose work I've studied uh, closely named Timothy Eastman, also interested. I've read in, some of Eastman. Uh, yeah. we, we've read some yeah, of Eastman. Right. We did. We read Eastman okay. together. Mm -hmm. Oh, wonderful. Great. Glad to have that, that shared context. Um, he distinguishes between um, actualism mm -hmm. and a view of nature, which would also allow um, for uh, what he calls potentia. Yeah, um, totally. All right. And so as long as the one world, like we want to hold the tension between the actual and the, uh, and the potential, uh, but we don't want to end up in a situation, which is what a kind of crude materialism suggests, where nature is just a bunch of already actualized stuff that gets rearranged. Yeah. Um, right. And so as long as one world is a, a one world wherein what's what really exists is this process of actualization, right, where for actualization to be a verb form to be a process means that it's it's advancing into novelty and novelty is not just a rearrangement of pre-existing parts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, another way of talking about this would be to say that there are emergent holes, um, that nature sure. is the process of new holes emerging, right? And, and we can understand that monistically. Um, Whitehead's interesting because he, you know, he points out that like Leibniz before him, there's also, it's not just monism versus dualism. We can talk about pluralism too, even in an ontological context, not just mm -hmm. like cultural pluralism or something, but mm -hmm. ontological pluralism where it's a little like Whitehead's a monist, but he's also, uh, his monism is, is constantly proliferating at its edges, which like mm -hmm. every concrescent actual occasion is the universe, he says, incarnating itself as one mm. and adding that new whole back to the many, which in the, mm. the next moment of concrescence gets unified again. And so mm -hmm. you're in his process philosophy, you're in this constant movement from the many to the one, the one back into the many. And it's this iterative cumulative process, which I think is unbroken. And there's an intimate relationality from moment to moment. There's not another world, but there is a way in which this world is incomplete and open to something transcendent, perhaps. So maybe transcendent naturalism is actually a great description for uh, a Whiteheadian ontology. I, I think so, uh, because I think um, I think emergence without emanation gives you kinds of species and varieties of epiphenomenalism, which I think are extremely ontologically. Uh, problematic. And in fact, if if it was the case that emergence, and it is not the case, but if it was the case that emergence entailed epiphenomenalism, I would regard that as a modus tollens on the proposal of emergence. Mm -hmm. So I think emergence without emanation makes no sense. And then I'm very influenced by Urero and the notion that what we're talking about with emanation, we're talking about constraints, we're talking about mm -hmm. what you were just talking about. We're talking about, <clears throat> we're talking about possibility being real and having a shape um, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm obviously speaking metaphorically here, but there's an organization, uh, to possibility. It's a triangle, John. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, it has a shape to it. And, and, and I, and that is of course, uh, something, uh, that I think, you know, was, uh, very much prefigured by Whitehead in the modern era. But of course, this was also, uh, an argument that was made in the, in, in, in Neoplatonism classically that, you know, um, there had to be a, a there had to be an ordering of the forms, etc. Um, I wanted to say one thing about uh, the imaginal before we completely lose the thread and then tie it back into what we've been just talking about, which is this notion of emergence, emanation, and reality realization or reality actualization. I think re realization is actually a better term because it doesn't pin us to actuality. Mm -hmm. Um, right, and it, and it carries that note of having an epistemic dimension possible within it. Um, so mm -hmm. I'm just offering that as a 
something that maybe is a little bit easier to use as a term. I just want to go back and about the imaginal. So Dan Shappy and I have written a bunch of papers, three about the NASA soldier, uh, Na not soldiers, NASA scientists moving the rovers around on Mars. And they do all of these weird, very imaginal things because what they're actually after in order to, before anybody can do the science, they have to get to, to the state where they can be the rover on Mars. They can get that perspectival seeing as the rover and as if both seeing as if you were the rover on Mars and as if you were the rover, not a human being on Mars. Mm -hmm. And they do all these very interesting things very naturally. Um, they'll do things like, first of all, they're, they will anthropomorphize the rover, which seems sort of intuitive to us. Like I, I need to move my arm there and I got to bring my eyes over there. And they're talking about uh, right, the cameras and stuff. But they'll do also the other thing. They'll, uh, uh, Bertessi, one of the ethnographers, talks about they'll technomorphize themselves. They'll, they'll like th this is a rock, and I and I need to and and they, what they'll do is they'll swivel around on the chair as if they're the rover and twisting their body. And what they're doing is they're doing this weird imaginal loop where they're sort of trying to imaginally, you know, take on you know, the way a kid pretends to be Zorro, they're trying to take on the rover. Uh, and they're also trying to uh, humanize the rover in this interactive loop. And then why I'm saying that, Matt, is you get that kind of thing you were you you were you were pointing to where about the entrained with the sunrise, because uh, we have direct quotes, I, I can't do it verbatim, but there were two or three along the lines of the one of these, you know, literal rocket scientists, hard nosed engineers saying, you know, I was in the garden and I was I was gardening and my right wrist kept getting sort of stuck. And I came into the lab and spirit, ironically, the name of one of the rovers and the spirit, its right wheel kept getting stuck that day. You know, I don't think there's any magic, but, you know, there's something going on. There's some kind of sympathetic connection and they're trying to articulate exactly um, I think what you were putting your finger on, they don't want to say that there's a direct causal relation, but they want to say it's not just a metaphor. There's some kind of bonding going on there. That, and, they, and what they're bumping up again and why they laugh is they, they end up using words they don't want to use, but that's because they don't have use words that they can use. And so they're in, a, they're in this really um, interesting mm -hmm. space. And, and what, what's really interesting about that is the fact that again, this isn't people being dragged into an, uh, an indoctrination. This is human beings having to confront a kind of new kind of environment and they fall into these strategies by nature in order to do the hard no science. It's not something orthogonal over here that's mm -hmm. being drip, put into them by an indoctrination. And, 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 and all of this is, I think, relatively non-controversial to say, because we literally have the ethnographies, we have multiple ethnographies, you know, we've published papers on this, this is how it happens. And so I, I, I'm just saying that because I wanted to strengthen your claim about the entrainment. And, and you, can get, you can get confused about that. You can think it's a straight sort of Newtonian linear causation, or there's some kind of weird telepathy or something like that. And, and then, then that's a confusion, but there's something else going on there about participation and the, how the imaginal augments your ability to become aware of things and affords you cultivating skills, even skills that are displaced over these vast distances. So I just wanted to give that as a buttressing of your point. Mm -hmm. But yeah. then to the religious point, so the thing that comes up for me is, and I forget who I'm reading, uh, uh, and he was basically making the argument, um, I think it's called Introduction to Process Relational F uh, Philosophy. Oh, Robert Mesel? Mesel, yes, mm -hmm. thank you. He was making mm -hmm. the point, and, and this is one of the things I want to probe on, um, and, and I'm, only, I'm only 30 or 50 pages into that book too, but he was saying that Whitehead provides this framework um, and this really pricked up my ears because as a cognitive scientist, I face scientists who talk at different levels using different language, using different machinery, do, 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 using different machinery. And Greg, of course, knows this. And, and that's why he's smiling right now because he's like, yeah, I know, right? And I talk about like the synoptic integration and there's this big part. And sorry, these two points are coming together because we need a language that allows to, to bridge between these different right, languages, the, the language of the neuroscientists, the language of the AI person, the language of the psychologist, right? And that language 
has to afford this kind of connectedness uh, that we were just talking about a few minutes ago. It, it like. The synoptic integration needs a language that can properly lead to these identifications across divides, like the NASA scientists are doing with the rover. Like, and, and it's not notice they're not they're not becoming rovers in any like literal sense. And this is not to say that Buddhists would become Christians, but that Buddhists could imaginally be Christians and Christians could imaginably be Buddhist, but they need a language that affords that happening. And he was arguing that Whitehead is actually mm. a place to look for that. And I wonder what you think about that argument. So, sorry, that took a while, but I was trying to draw these two points together and bring it back to you. I think absolutely Whitehead provides a, a means of translating between the deep intuitions that guide various religions. Um, he, his, his goal in, you know, a book like Process and Reality, and in other books where he continues to try to elaborate this uh, cosmological scheme, as he calls it, is to is to provide a set of general categories that everyone, regardless of their faith commitment, um, would be able to uh, recognize themselves in to some degree, right. And so for example, in his in his process theology, he has these, these twin ultimates, there's creativity, and then there's God. Mm -hmm. um, and he distinguishes between the two, uh, not because Buddhists are going to be super excited that there's a God in his metaphysics and be like, oh, okay, yeah, we can accept that. No, usually they don't. There's a lot of great um, comparative literature on this. Um, I say, oh, Abe, a student of Nishitani yeah. has written on this and um, is deeply appreciative of, of the uh, approach to a kind of non-dualism and dependent origination in, in Whitehead's work, but ultimately there's still a God, so it uh, doesn't quite work. But this other ultimate of creativity is much more akin to the kind of emptiness that um, mm -hmm. a Buddhist would want to, to say uh, the ultimate nature of reality is such as, as this. Um, you know, so there's at least something for everyone in Whitehead's scheme, even if it's not ultimately going to be satisfying to anyone, like traditional mm -hmm. Christians, for example, or, or Muslims, don't like the idea that God is a creature of creativity. They want an omnipotent head honcho, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, Whitehead doesn't give you that, but he gives you a reason for why you might idolatrous, idolatrously think that God is like that, uh, mm -hmm. which also for people committed to that view obviously doesn't help either. Uh, so he can't satisfy everyone, but I do think the effort is, as he put it in his sort of Victorian early 20th century way, it was an attempt to, rash, to, to rationalize religion uh, and to secularize the concept of God's function in the world, as he put it. Um, he chose to use the G word despite how charged it is because he thinks there is something um, electric about it and it has a charge for a reason and we can't just avoid, avoid the topic. But he's really, he's like William James, trying to be very empirical yeah. about religion and look at religious experience, the experience of human beings across continents in response to something, spirit, mystery, the depths of nature, however you want the ancestors, however you want to refer to what that mystery is. Um, that history of religious human experience is a fact about the universe we inhabit on some level, if human totally. beings are part of it. And so how do we integrate all of it in, in a scheme that is adequate to it and doesn't explain any of it away so that would be Matt, what whitehead's trying to do yeah i think that's good but the and and thank you for that i think that's very good um but what what i what what's what i'm all what i'm also seeing and i mean i've seen it before but i'm seeing it again um, um that that scheme isn't just processed in sort of argument uh you know uh sort of premise by premise argumentation. I'm not saying Whitehead doesn't make arguments. He makes very careful arguments. But Whitehead also admits that there is this imaginative leap, but it's not the imaginary. There's an imaginal. There's something going on here in which, and this is what this is what I'm I'm I'm, I'm sort of asking you to tease out a little bit. There's there's the imagination is somehow sensitizing us 
uh, to things that we can't get just by sort of the incremental progression of an argument. And in that sense, it's not imaginary, it's imaginal, it's affording a kind of knowing. Um, and that seems to also be some, somehow crucial to the scheme. Uh, it, it, first of all, is that a fair thing to say about Whitehead? And um, Yeah, I mean, so let's let's distinguish traditional naturalism from transcendent naturalism, where traditional naturalism would say, look, we've got five senses and right. we can make precise measurements through especially the eyes and we've got logic and math. And so let's combine the two and get the truth about nature. And Whitehead's saying that picture of what the human cognitive apparatus is, 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 is woefully inadequate and incomplete. Mm -hmm. um, we're more than just the five senses and the brain uh, to, to, to speak loosely, right? We have um, our whole bodies are involved in the way that we know, as, as you were describing earlier. And imagination, I think, is, um, is a, you know, Whitehead's a, he's coming out of the natural sciences and mathematics um but also romantic poetry mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and so imagination for whitehead is holy it is the base of um of our experience and and in some sense the the font of our existence right mm -hmm. in, in in a in a mystical uh way and i'm i'm speaking poetically here obviously but i think the romantics were naive in some ways but in in this basic intuition that uh, art and science or, or poetry and nature are not actually as um, separable as the yeah. Enlightenment may have supposed. I right. think that's Ooh. true and mm. beautiful. It's not true mm. because it's beautiful, but but the whole romantic point is that uh, you, you can't tease, you can't finally tear these two ideals apart, beauty and truth, mm. right? Mm. And so imagination becomes an organ of perception, uh, or a, um, a mode of engaging with the reality, with nature, that isn't finished yet, right? So rather than thinking as, tradi as a traditional naturalism would, that this is the, the, the way that the human cognitive apparatus is set up, it's finished, it's like this, it's the senses, it's, it's uh, intellectual abstraction, logic and math, uh, and let's, let's create our model of, of nature based on that. Um, I think imagination and the, the way that we can um, cultivate new forms of perception like these scientists are doing with a rover uh as a great example it means that our our capacity to experience is not yet finished and it's not closed and we can't mm. prejudge what it what the the limits of empiricism might be right mm -hmm. um, which is why we can do phenomenology of religion in the way mm -hmm. that that you know James kind of inaugurates, um, and why we might even be able to think of a kind of science of the mind or spiritual science, where mm -hmm. through contemplative activities we're actually exploring a domain that's inner or imaginal, but still objective in some way that we can come to mm -hmm. have peers who can, uh, through review of one another's um, insights, begin to you know cultivate a real intersubjective sense of, of grasping something objective, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, for all these reasons, I think understanding relating to imagination as of epistemic and ontological import is crucial. It's not just for literature mm -hmm. um, and art and music. It's, it's got scientific and religious significance. I think that one of the things I really like the way you articulated uh, tr the traditional versus transcendent naturalism there, uh, and I think we should uh, put a footnote in it. No pun intended. Um, <laughs> uh, but uh, to, to to you know, John, me, and I come back or whatever. Um, I, I I was I, I don't remember if you remember this, John, but at some point we were talking, and uh, as our systems were syncing up, uh, we, it went from four P three R to six P four R where the other two P's are a primate, which then held your perspectival participatory and procedural knowing and a person holding your propositional knowing. And then four R, so you get the recursive uh, relevance realization in relation, which then places people uh, in a dialogical into dialogos context. Right. Um, so what I was then just as I was hearing is like, yeah, we are really upgrading 
this sensory logic, you know, logical, empirical, analytic view of what's going to deduce uh, and building an onto epistemology of the knower and known uh, and creating a context for that that didn't exist before, but now when it exists, a much richer picture, in many ways more Whiteheadian picture, or, or Whitehead is a founder of this, or, uh, you know, this moving in this direction. So I deeply appreciated that um, articulation and was resonating mm -hmm. with it. Let me, can I introduce a distinction here that might be helpful, because I don't want to be misunderstood here. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I studied with, uh, at University of Central Florida when he was still a professor there, uh, Sean Gallagher, of course, uh, yeah. He wrote a book mm -hmm. that came out around that time when I was there called How, How the Body Shapes the Mind yep. and uh, mm -hmm. distinguishes between the body schema, uh, mm -hmm. which is, is um, and the body image. And the body schema would be more like um, these sensory motor capacities that, that are kind of uh, part of our phenotype, part of our physiology, part of our... Um, uh, our bodies that that uh, kind mm -hmm. of work automatically without our having to uh, consciously attend to them uh, or monitor them and the body image would be um more about our beliefs and mm -hmm. uh our attitudes mm -hmm. and and being able to actively exercise imagination so as to inhabit other kinds of bodies so like what you're describing uh that the the nasa scientists are doing with the rovers everybody does this when they get in a car and drive around um our body image is the extent to which we can, through an act of will, begin to inhabit the in, inhabit other bodies. Let's say, um, but that doesn't mean that that our 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 physiology is just something that our imagination can right. will to be different. Yeah, of course, um, right. And so, to think of the imagination as an organ of perception, it's like it's the um, you know the uh, Spinoza and I think uh, a lot of the romantics like this distinction between natura naturata and natura naturans, right? Where the naturans is the is the process uh, of of um, of realization or the the process of growth in nature that's active and creative, and the naturata would be the finished forms, mm -hmm. um, the products mm -hmm. rather than the process. And when we're talking about imagination. This is the process out of which. Uh, through perception, perception, action loops over the course of evolutionary history. It's the process out of which the physiological sense organs that we have emerged, mm -hmm. right? And so, but once they've emerged and taken on physical form, the imagination kind of has to work with them as just stubborn habits that are there, right? And so there is a, um, there's a limit obviously to what imagination can uh, allow us to experience and perceive and it can take a billion years uh of evolutionary time to fully grow that new organ of perception right but we didn't just start out with eyes and ears and like the senses that we have i think are in some profound resonance with an attunement to something real in the world mm -hmm. right and there's a tendency in a darwinian view to think well that's just we happen to fall into those sort of sensory niches or whatever, but we could have ended up with totally different senses. And that's a that's a key inflection point, I think, where we go on that question, the extent to which we could easily end up in like a Donald Hoffman idealism, if we think that the senses that happen to to evolve as a result of these action perception loops um, are totally contingent and just creating some um, dashboard that allowed us to survive well enough. Or if we think in a more Gertian way, let's say, that no, the eyes are the way they are because light, in some sense, called them forth. Mm -hmm. And so there's some way in which the eyes are sun-like is, is how Goethe put it, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not just arbitrary. The senses that we have are um, microcosmic uh, um, recapitulations of what was macrocosmic before. Right. And so where we come down on that question, I think, changes a lot about how about what we think science is. I mean, I don't want to go into Donald Hoffman's whole, whole view, but I start to wonder how we can even do science. Well, I, if I the scientific claim he's making. 
I pose okay, that good. challenge directly. <laughs> like you, 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 you rely on evolutionary theory, and you need that to be right. true, right? And then, and and and, and then, if evolutionary theory is true, you have to rely on geology being true, tectonic forces, and then chemistry, and then it builds out tremendously. Um, um, you know, but I, I want right. to also say that you know, contrary to maybe some of his YouTube appearances, when I was in discussion with Donald, he was very, very humble, very open. Uh, yeah. Very respectful. Oh, his papers um, are very, very rigorous and well argued. But yeah, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, well, whereas I do think the argument I'm making has merit. I want to make it clear that um, um, I think um, not, none of us are characterizing um, him. He's, he's sure. Careful. I think there are good arguments either direction. I'm just pointing out like yep. where we go when we think of mm -hmm. you know body like the body schema is used to be body image in a way is what mm -hmm. I'm is what I'm saying. Right, but as the physiology builds, yeah, yeah, I think you got the point already. But so there's two ways, and I know we're getting close to being out of time. And I want to, I want to, I don't, want, I don't want to tackle the one now, but I want to talk about God, and I want to talk mm -hmm. about you know this idea of something like reality realization and sharing the same grammar as relevance realization, um, which I think is something I'd like to explore with you. Um, but I want to mm -hmm. come under the other side, and I want, I want to. Um, and if you need more time for this, um, uh, I, I, um, I understand. So, um, because this is a little bit more of a criticism, I, uh, and which is, you know, part of the way, and this is also what came out of the work on the rovers, right? And, and part of this is the idea that a lot of the way we enhance our perception, I'll, I'll put it more like the way we grok the world, because <laughs> we need a, we need a, we need a different term. For those of you who don't know it, that's from Robert Heinlein, Strange, Stranger to Strange Land. Um, is, is through the collective intelligence of distributed cognition, and there's lots of evidence, you know, that that's that has its own uh, non-reducible causal power and causal signature. And then, and then, you know, I, I Dan and I put that together with Tom, you know, with Morton's idea about hyper objects that there are things that we yeah. as individuals can't perceive, like evolution, like global warming, that you need a or even a even navigating a ship as Hitchens does as cognition in the wild. You need a you need a system of people distributed across space and time, right? Often supplemented by machines and technologies in order to actually perceive or grok these hyper objects. And so uh, and another thing that religions did was they talked about this. They talked about spirits and they talked about bodies of Christ and they talked about the Sangha. And there was this dialogical distributed function and it was given an important role in how people could enter into a proper um, epistemic and, and uh, epistemological and ontological relationship to reality. And I'm, I, I'm, and you know, absence is not the same thing as negation. I get that, but I'm, I'm not, I'm not seeing that, that in Whitehead, I'm not seeing mm -hmm. the emphasis on the dialogical and the distributed on the spirits that, you know, to you to speak a little bit poetically, that can inhabit uh, distributed mm -hmm. cognition, and uh, you know, you, you know, I do a, I teach a thing called dialectic into dialogos, and the logos show that shows up, and if people naturally start even dependent, they can come from the most secular background. They start talking about this, this collective intelligence, this collective flow, and the way it's disclosing themselves to each other and reality to all of them and to each of them, having a life of its own. Um, and they start talking about it in religious language, and I don't think that's a coincidence. And so I think part of the way, and I think this is in, in a profound sense connected to everything we're talking about. It's it's ritual, it's imaginal, it's, it's a way in which religions have pointed out how human beings can grok reality beyond their five senses that doesn't necessarily involve magical claims or anything like that. And for all of the brilliance of Whitehead, I don't, I don't see that in anything i've been i've read but you've read a lot more than i have uh matt and i don't want to make an unfair criticism i want to that's why i wanted to talk to you about it and i wanted to say mm -hmm. this seems to be an important feature you know an epistemological ontological function of religion and it really points to the imaginal it points to ritual it points to you know you know uh you know grokking prehending the world beyond the five senses in profound ways and it's integral to the practice of science we see it with the you know with the nasa scientists that's one of the things we talked about and so mm -hmm. i just wanted to hear what i want to give you an opportunity to like respond to that yeah i mean uh i would point you to whitehead's 
uh, concept of societies and his mm. sense of the 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 way in which it's it's through social relationships that um, experience becomes amplified and eventually conscious. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, it's like he says every every act of experience is a social effort employing the whole universe. I think is basically a, one of his lines, but. And he'll also, when he's talking about Plato's Timaeus, um, talk about Plato's understanding of uh, these subordinate deities who are the yeah. animating principles of different yeah. departments of nature, as Whitehead puts it. Uh, and, and he's trying to capture something like this emergent agency of collectives and swarms um, with his notion of societies. Uh, so I, I, would, I would say zoom in on that concept, and I think you'll yeah. get something closer to this idea of distributed cognition and also in um in his discussion of language in um, modes of thought and and other books but in modes of thought in particular he says something like um that if the creation of the world could be rewritten rewritten we could say on the sixth day god gave them language and they became souls the human beings mm -hmm. and language in, in in context, he had been discussing the history of language as a technology that allows for a kind of shared memory and shared cognition. Um, and first, the you know oral language, but then written language in particular allows us to so enhance um, our capacity for cultural memory. And so he's thinking in terms of ex an extended mind or mm. uh, something like. Yeah, distributed cognition. So I think it's there in his thought. Um, it, it's just uh, maybe it's not obvious immediately, but it's something to do with how he thinks of societies um, of actual occasions. Uh, but you know, his jargon can be the, the 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 price of admission to to his cosmos is high because you have to study and and. Uh, learn the, the categories and the lingo. Well, that's but, why I wanted know. to talk to you. I didn't want to make any yeah. claims based on ignorance. And I do, I have read some of this. And now that you've called it out, I hadn't grasped it under that aspect. And I hadn't made that connection. And I think that's powerful. Uh, because one of the things, and I don't know if you're going to come to this in your book that I find, and you and I sort of bumped up against this last time we were talking, is there, you know, Locke's and Descartes' individualism seems to also have been really accentuated by Kant. And I think this was deeply problematic. And I think one of the things Hegel was trying to do was to deeply respond to that um, in, in a powerful fashion. Um, mm -hmm. And so um, I guess I'm just happy to hear that then because that, that lends even more power to the proposal that Whitehead might have a way of talking about, I think, this important aspect of religion as a epistemological uh, engine and a transformational engine. Because this topic, this topic is coming to the fore right now, uh, because you know mm -hmm. social media has made egregores and um, collectivities um, prominent again, and many people, Jonathan Pajot and others, are are taking this up as saying, you know, and making use of my work, um, saying that this is this is we're we're talking about what the what ancient people talked about when they talked about spirits, and we, we and when again we don't have to get into any kind of supernaturalism now to talk about them right and I, I do need to run here but i think a good place a good place to end perhaps would be to say that you know the reason i haven't ever yet felt comfortable just referring to my approach as naturalistic or identifying with naturalism is because i would feel just as uncomfortable saying i'm a spiritualist right or that we should right. affirm spiritualism but i do think spirit in some sense is just as real and important to talk about as nature we don't need to conceive of them as in two separate worlds or something we need to think of think them together somehow yeah, yeah. but mm -hmm. but i think both of these words still have power and we need to include them in our conversation about <laughs> the ultimate mm -hmm. nature of reality okay so let's let, let's pick up on that and i'm going to let you go in a sec let's talk about spirits and we'll talk about god next time and but uh, hopefully people are going to stick with us because we they realize we're not just sort of drifting into uh woo here we're, we're really going <laughs> to I wrestle with something profound. Um, and uh, I want to thank both of you and Greg. Greg, I'm just sort of rushing things a little for Matt. Matt, we always yeah. give the, we always give the person, you're coming back for another episode, but we always give the person the last word. 
Okay. Well, I think I just had it. <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> well, wonderful. Right. We'll pick this up yeah. in a week then. Appreciate okay. you both and uh, look forward to next week. Hey, good Amen. Care. Bye-bye. Bye. Take care.